Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. Thank you for coming out today to our midweek noonday Bible study. Amen. For those who be watching this tonight, uh, recorded, amen. We praise the Lord for you also. And those who are tuned in online right now, we thank you for joining us. Let's pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord, for the awesome and loving and caring God that you are. Lord, we're nothing without you. Thank you so much, Lord, for uh, redeeming us, choosing us, my God, and, and my God, and have us uh, close to your heart. Uh, Lord, you are a great and awesome God, and we thank you for your word. And so, Lord, we ask you to help us today and teach us today, Lord, that we can absorb and inhale and allow the word to feed us today. We give you glory for it now. We pray this full of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm uh, really going to pull out of there verse 17. Even though Ephesians 6 deals with the whole armor of God, the Apostle Paul here in Ephesians 6 uh, talks about that armor. Um, and, uh, and so the Apostle Paul was probably using the analogy of a Roman soldier, since that was very prevalent in his day and how they were equipped uh, for battle and, uh, and use that as our way of, of defense uh, as we could say the Christian soldier. But we're going to focus on uh, verse 17, uh, the latter part of verse 17. In verse 17, Ephesians 6 and 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God which is the word of God. So we, we ministered on this on Sunday, and uh, we're just going to continue in that vein today that talks about just the word of God, its power, and one of the areas that Scripture refers to it as the sword of the Spirit. Sword of the Spirit. So when you think about the inspired word of God, the Apostle Paul brings out here that for us, that is a sword, right? A sword in the spirit or in the spirit realm, if you will, right? Uh, it doesn't mean you go to someone with your Bible and try and cut them or hurt them. No, it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual type of thing. Amen. And, uh, amen. and it didn't Mother Tucker do a wonderful job last week? That was a wonderful Bible study. Amen. It really, really did minister and ministered to me for sure. So the sport of, sword of the spirit is the word of God. Now, it's interesting that um, there are many things that God uses in the Bible that talks about the Bible or talks about the Word. Um, but I think this is probably one of the most powerful as it relates to us using the Word uh, to really overcome things in this life, right? And, uh, and we probably don't use it enough. Right? We don't apply the word to enough things that we're trying to overcome in life. Um, and I think that's part of our nature before it becomes second nature, is that normally we try and alleviate a problem or alleviate pain or create ease by trying to do something on our own. But we have the word of God, which is powerful like a sword. And so it's important that we see the word like that, that it, it has that type of power. And of course, you're going to find scriptures all through that, that make, may make reference to that. And I think one of them would be in Judges chapter 7. So let's go to Judges chapter 7. This would be very uh, uh, common to, to most of us. And this has to do with the, the battle of Gideon over the Midianites, right? And so... Uh, this story is amazing to me because, you know, remember that when Gideon was called by God, Gideon didn't see himself as a leader at all, right? Uh, he was in hiding, if you will. Uh, remember, he was even threshing wheat in a wine press, which w wouldn't make it very effective because to thresh wheat, you need open air and you need a wind for it to be effective. But but he had a lot of fear in his life over the enemy, the Midianites. God calls him, and, you know, he, he had to fleece the Lord a couple times, right, to make sure this was God on his calling. 
And then we see here in Judges 7, and we're not going to read all of this, but we're going to take pieces of it. Uh, Judges 7 and 1 says, Then Jerubal, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the hosts of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Mora in the valley. So we get a picture here that God has planted uh, Gideon and the army of Israel uh, to look down into the valley of the Midianites, which are the enemy. And the Lord God said unto Gideon, verse 2, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand hath saved me. I think that, it, that scripture right there is so powerful that there is no way that God is going to fight our battles for us in a way that we're going to take the credit for it, right? If you can do it with your own means and your own ways, then we'll take the glory from God. It's our nature to do that, right? And so what God will do is he'll put you, therefore, then in situations where you can't do it on your own. All we have then is God, and therefore then God gets the glory, else we'll try to take some of the credit. Okay? And so that's what we see here. This is, this is an important principle in this whole battle here, is that God is saying, right, Israel is going to mess themselves up because they're going to get prideful and say they did it, when I'm actually the one who's going to defeat the Midianites for Israel. It also says something about God, how much he cares for his people, right? That he wants to fight our battles for us. He just gives us the tools to do so, the instruction in his word to do so. And so, you know the story, Gideon had 32,000 in his army, right? And God says, you know, you got way too many. He says, so all of those that are afraid, send them home. Right? And, and so what happened? Think about that. Out of 32,000 in the army, 22,000 said, yeah, I'm afraid. I'm going home. That left 10,000. Now understand this, that they were up against an army of about 135,000. Right? So already starting out, you have 32,000 against 135,000. God says, definitely, if you guys were going there and win this battle, you're going to take all the glory from me. So 22,000 leave, Gideon dismisses them, and now we have 10,000 remaining, and God says, you still have too many. Think about that. I don't know about you, but 10,000 against 135,000 doesn't seem like too many. But that's when we're looking at it from our perspective, not from God's. So it says something about God can do anything. God is so powerful that numbers don't matter. All you want to make sure is God is on your side and you follow God's instructions. And so God told Gideon, right, take them down to, to drink water. And they went down to drink water. And he says, those of them who lap up water like a dog, right? Let me ask you this. When was the last time you drank water like a dog, right? Have you ever seen a dog drink water? How they lap it up with their tongues. They can be at the water dish for a long time, right? Because, it take, you know, they're getting just a little bit at a time, right? And they'll stay there, and most of it falls all over the floor or whatever. Then they get in their mouth. But I think what God was showing is, is I want those who are going to follow instructions and be alert of the enemy so they're lapping up water, keeping their heads up, looking at the enemy. The other ones that were thirsty, right, they just put their head in the water, got on their knees, bowed down to the water and drank it. And what is that? This says something about they would have been exposed to the enemy. They're not ready to fight. They're not thinking about fighting. And so God said, all those that lap like a dog, those are the ones you'll fight with. And now we're down to 300. Think about that. 300 against 135,000. So if you go now to Judges 7 and 9, it says, And it came to pass that same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, go down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. 
So God tells Gideon, with your 300, I am going to deliver the Midianites into your hand. Verse 18, when I blow with a trumpet and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now, we're using Paul's example here back in Ephesians that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Here we see an example, this, despite the odds that are against Israel, they had instructions to do a certain thing, to blow their trumpets and hold up their lamps, and they are to proclaim the sword of the Lord. Right? They're proclaiming the victory of the word. They're proclaiming that you are fighting against the sword of God. Thank you, Jesus. Right? Go down to verse 20. It says, And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers, held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands, and they to, to blow with all, and they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And it stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the hosts ran and cried and fled. In other words, the, the Midian camp was, was afraid, and the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord said, Every man soared against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts, and the hosts fled, and, it's, and it shows that they began to run off. They had so much fear that they were coming out of their tents, cutting anybody who was near them. So what were they doing? They were killing each other. The Midianites were killing each other, which, when you think about that, if God would have told them that ahead of time, said, yeah, right, that's, like, that's really going to happen. But it tells you the power of God's word and following the instruction of his word. God is never going to do it in a way that we can possibly see it done. He does it his own way so that he gets all the glory. And that we have a greater dependence then from then forward on his word. Thank you, Jesus. But perhaps Moses talks about how powerful the sword of the spirit is. It is powerful. And, and really, we don't use his word enough. We don't speak to our situations and circumstances and and, and, and spiritual warfare and all the things. We don't speak his word enough. And, and we, we, we must do that, especially in this day we live in. Okay? So what does this illustrate? It illustrates that God and God alone is the one who gives us the victory. Right? I mean, the very first victory perhaps in our life is what? Victory over sin. Victory over hell. But we didn't do that. Christ did that for us by going to the cross for us and paying the price for our sin. So what did he do? He gave us the victory. We received it. We accepted it. But he's the one who did all the work of the victory. Which means this, that the heart of God, the passion of God for humanity, for his people, is that, amen, he wants to be our sword. He wants to be, amen, the one who gives us the victory. Now, now, of course, what happens after that? Gideon gets to receive some glory and praise. God will share, but amen, but we can't take it from God. It's just what he shares. So therefore, it is a privilege, it is an honor that God would even give us his word to use to fight our battles, to overcome this world, to overcome whatever comes against us. Thank you, Jesus. So therefore, we have to learn how to take the sword in Ephesians 6, you begin to see that there's a lot of defensive armor, right? There's the helmet and the breastplate and your loins girt about and, you know, uh, you, you have uh, the shin guards, if you will, and, and then you have a, a shield and all that. But the sword is the only offensive weapon. It's the only offensive weapon. And I think sometimes we just have a defensive mindset. Right? We want to be protected, but we don't necessarily want to fight. But the beauty of the protection is that, yes, the enemy is not going to be able to penetrate the protection, 
But watch this. The enemy will not go away unless we use the sword. Can you imagine a, a Roman soldier that has all that protection but no sword? It, all he is then is a defensive moving target. Right? The enemy is going to fire the darts and the arrows and everything else. And yeah, you can defense against that, but you can't stop the fight because you don't have an offensive weapon. The sword is your offensive weapon to take out the enemy and say, uh-uh, we're not fighting today. Boom. Cut the enemy down. That's what the word of God is for us. But how often do we go on the defensive? How often do we just go into hiding? I don't want to fight today. I'm not even going to get out of the bed. I'm just, Jesus, help me. Right? When God says, I gave you everything you need to defeat your enemy. And yet, we don't go there. Yeah. So we have to be more than heavily armored moving targets. We got to pick up the sword and use it, Right? So let's talk about a couple things about the Word of God. Uh, Psalms 119 and 105 says, The Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Okay? So the Word of God is this offensive weapon, but notice what else it does. It illuminates. It directs our paths. It, this, this scripture is pretty amazing because not only does it light up the path we're going to walk on, it lights up our feet. Right? It, 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 it says something about how God cares about every part of us, that it brings light to our feet and light onto the pathway. It, it, it knows how to handle where you're standing now, but it knows how to illuminate where you need to go. And, and that's important, right? I mean, we can look down, right, to make sure that we don't step on something or stub our toe on something and all that and look right here, but we may be on the wrong path. I mean, you, you can make sure you don't step on nothing. The next thing you know, you walk right off a cliff. So, so we need both. We need the light on our feet, but we also need it on our path. So we know where we're going. And the word of God lightens up our path and gives us direction about where to go. Thank you, Jesus. Well, another thing about it, lighting our feet, think about that. This is what the sword of the spirit does, too. This is what the word does, too. It shines a light on us also. Uh-oh. What is good and what is bad, right? It, it illuminates, not just in us, it illuminates to others. We, we see what is wise and what is unwise. You can receive, amen, uh, instruction from somebody, but you're going to have to discern whether that was wise instruction or unwise instruction. And the only way to properly discern that is you got to run it through the Word of God. Does this line up with the Word of God? Because the Word of God brings light to it, and then we see it. Oh, that was wisdom. That, that wasn't wisdom. It's going to expose. It's that kind of a light. Thank you, Jesus. So this is great because we can be free from things that we could stumble on, through the word of God, right, we can be free from any restraints that might hold us back, uh, any, any, any roadblocks that are coming ahead, we'll see them ahead of time, right? It keeps us from falling and stumbling in darkness because we see it. The, the word of God is that lamp. Thank you, Jesus. And then John 17 and 17 says, Sanctify them by your truth, your word is Truth. We hit on this a little bit Sunday about the purity of God's word. Um, but bottom line that we need to grasp is God's word is truth, plain and simple. It's truth and it is pure. Now, that's powerful because you, you have to believe in that, have faith in that. And as I was saying, Sunday, you have to relate with that. The living word is alive. It's something to relate to. Because... What does the adversary do? It tries to discredit the word to tell you that there's errors in it, that things don't line up, right? And if you believe that, that's deception. 
And so therefore you won't give yourself fully to the word. Uh, it may or may not be true. And so you have to understand, God's word is truth. Even when it doesn't make sense, his word is still true. Thank you, Jesus. And so we need that because truth is what? It says something about God's word is accurate, right? It is without error. I mean, almost anything that we have in this world has some error in it, some flaw in it. It's not completely perfect, but God's word is. It's probably the only thing we can really count on to be without error is the word of God. Thank you, Jesus. And so we need that. We need that truth in a life that has so much deception, right? And, and so you need that because... God just kind of dropped this. I don't know who this is for, but unfortunately, there are man-made ideas that are put across over the pulpit, and they don't really line up with God's word, but the scripture is twisted for this man-made idea to come forth. And if you don't know the word for yourself or run that word that was given, or a false word maybe, if you don't run it through the word, you don't run it through truth, you'll never know the difference between truth and error. Well, the man of God said it. That's not enough. The man of God can err. The man of God can get his own ideas or, or passion, vision, something into it that doesn't line up with God's word. One thing I learned very early on, and, and, and my first pastor told us this, amen, you go back and you rehearse that word to make sure what I tell you is correct. Which let me know he's probably teaching the truth because, you know, who's going to tell you to correct me? But I say the same thing. Okay, if, I'm, if I have erred in something, I need to know about that so I can check myself. What did I do wrong there? But most of all, so that you get the true word of God because it's full of truth with no error. Thank you, Jesus. And that's what we count on. All right, what does it say in Hosea 4 and 6? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That lack of, lack of knowledge there is talking about his law, right, in the Old Testament, which is what? Where I reveal my will. You see, the word of God is written for us to do what? To reveal the will of God for us. But if we don't know God's will, then what happens? He said, my people are destroyed for not having the knowledge of the word. The word is what's going to keep you. The word is going to keep you right with God. The word is going to keep us from being destroyed. He says, because you, I'm reading in the Amplified, because you, the priestly nation, have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being my priest. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. So we need the knowledge of the word. We have to embrace it. And it's the knowledge of the word, he's saying here, that makes us uh, honorable before God as a priestly nation. Right? And, and that knowledge of the word, when you have the knowledge of God's word in here, understanding the will of God for your life, here's what you do. You impart it to others especially your own. You impart it to your children, to your grandchildren. I'm learning to do that now. Even though our grandson is not yet two years old, I'm trying to impart the word into him. And I found this, which I can't believe because he comes from, from, from such good genealogy and genes. That the boy don't even want to pray before dinner. And, and I'm not praying long. You might be saying, well, you're praying too long, you know. I say a quick grace, and he's already, at, okay, let's put our hands together. Lord, we thank you for this. Man, we didn't even get started. Can you wait till we say in Jesus' name? Thank you for this food in Jesus' name. Okay, let's eat. You know, that's where the prayer is right now. Because he don't have a relation with God. He just sees this as a hindrance to me getting this food. Don't put the food in front of me and then want to have a prayer. That's kind of where he's at right now. Sometimes that's us too, right? Mm. 
Yes. So, so we got to pass this knowledge along, but, but you don't just pass it through words. We, we pass it through our life. We pass it through our lifestyle. We pass it by showing the will of God in our lives, and others see that same will of God. Otherwise, it says we're destroyed. As you see a nation, you pick any nation, you certainly pick the United States, as it gets away from the knowledge of God, what do you see? It's being destroyed. That's the word of God. The word of God is truth, right? We will perish for lack of knowledge as a nation, right? Now, thank God we belong to a different nation, right? We belong to the nation of God. We're a nation of high priests. But, but yeah, you'll see the constant decay and the destroying of a nation as they get away from the knowledge of God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And then also, it's important that, uh, that we understand that there's a blessing to the word of God to be able to hear it and to keep it. Luke 11, 27, 28, I'm reading the Amplified Version. It says, now while Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, now this is amazing, Jesus is teaching, right? And then, you know, it, it appears, I don't know if this is real like this, but it says, as he's saying these things, a woman in the crowd almost interrupts. I think she's interrupting by the fact that she sees who Jesus is and she's, she wants to give him praise and, and re recognize that this is not a normal man. And she said, blessed, happy, favored by God is the womb that gave, you, that gave birth to you and the breast at which you nurse, amplified version. But then he says this, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and continually observe it. So, so notice what Jesus did here. This, this woman is kind of heaping praise on Jesus about who he is. And so he's saying, you know, obviously the woman that brought you in and nursed you into this world is so blessed. She's seen him more from a selfish point of view because of how great Jesus is. But Jesus says, no, that's, that's not really the true blessing. The true blessing are those who hear the word of God and continually observe. Right now, Jesus is the word and he's imparting word. She was having some praise there, but he's saying, uh -uh, don't don't focus on that. Focus on the words I'm giving you and observe it. And then you'll have great blessing in your life. So we are blessed by hearing the word of God and then observing it and continuing to observe it. Right. And of course, this knowledge then isn't just for us or for our blessing, but it's for others also. First Peter uh, 3 and 15 in the Amplified Version reads, But in your heart set Christ apart as holy, acknowledging him, giving him first place in your lives as Lord. Always be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope and confidence assurance that is within you. Do it with gentleness and respect. So what are we to do? We're, we're to give an answer with the word of God to those who may come against us or those who are seeking knowledge of the word of God. So the word of God, we have to have it in us because it is something to share with others. It's a knowledge of God to pass on to others. It's the knowledge of the will he has for our lives to pass on to others. He says so that you can do that with confidence and assurance. That's, that's valuable. The question then is this, is that would you be able to give a defense of the gospel if someone asked you some questions about the gospel? Now, the gospel is simple, right? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for our sins, to pay the price for our sins. The gospel is, is quite simple, right? And, and I like what it says here, and then do it with gentleness and respect. Here's what I have found that when... When you catch someone off guard and they don't know how to answer you, they go wild on you, right? They almost question why you ask them because they really don't have the answer. I can't believe you asked me that. Well, that's because you don't 
obviously know the answer. Right? It's a cover-up. I'm not going to answer that. You don't deserve an answer to ask me a question like that. I'll see you next week. They're going to go find the answer in a week, right? Instead of just admitting, hey, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer. Let's, let's figure it out together, right? And so it, it speaks of that we must give the word of God when it's asked about us, a defense of the gospel, right? But we must do it with gentleness and respect. In other words, for it to be received, there must be a right attitude behind it. There must be a true heart of love because that's how God gives us the word. He's doing it out of his love. Now, some people could say and look at the book of Revelation, for instance, and say, that don't look like God's love. All these plagues. Well, you ever think about this? It is. Because why does he just do one plague at a time? You know what he's trying to do? One plague? Okay, people, come to repentance. I'm being merciful. Another plague, come on, people, come to repentance, be merciful. Another plague, come on, people, come to repentance, I'm merciful. What's he doing? He's still doing it in love. He really is, right? And then when they have rejected all of his love and mercy, then comes the final judgment. You obviously have made your choice. You have hardened your heart against me, so then the final judgment. But it's all still done with love and mercy. So he's saying the same thing. When you know the word of God, you will give it in love and in mercy, even in its defense against someone who may be coming against you with the wrong spirit. The word, here's what it's also saying. The word can defend itself. <laughs> Just speak the truth and let the word do what the word does. Here's what the word will do. The, the word works on the heart. Once you plant the seed of God's word, God knows how to bring that seed up in someone's life. When trouble hits, when problems hit, in the middle of the night, when they can't sleep, God, is, the word is working on hard hearts. It's at work. The word, remember, the word is alive. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Hmm. My God. So, it kind of gives us to an idea why uh, we see here the analogy of the word as the sword of the spirit. So we would think, well, why a sword? Why, why do we have a comparison with the word also as a sword? Well, Hebrews 4 and 12, right? Hebrews 4 and 12, it says, For the word of God is living, quick, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. <laughs> That's quite a sword. Not only is it a sword that can penetrate, but notice this. It is so sharp, it is surgical. Right? I mean, I've never had any uh, operation done on me, you know, or, or anything like that. But it's obvious that if, if uh, a surgeon is, is doing surgery on you, you want to make sure that what he's going to cut you with, it's called a scalpel, I believe, that it is sharp. Now, how many of you ever cut yourself with a, a razor blade, right? Yeah. You know, I'll do some work around the yard, and, you know, you, you get the little blades that you're supposed to put in the thing, the handle. But, you know, I'm so impatient, I'll just get the little razor blade and go to cut the cardboard, and next thing I know, oh, man, I'm bleeding. You almost don't feel it because... It is such a surgical cut, right? It is so thin, but it cuts easily into our flesh, right? And so the word of God is like that. It is surgical, sharper than a two-edged sword. Think about that. It cuts both ways, cuts going in, cuts going out both sides. It is surgical. So notice it says, and it's alive, okay? So remember that. The word is always alive. So therefore, it's quick and it's powerful. <laughs> it's quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than that two-edged sword, right? It's sharper than a scalpel, if you will, right? It knows how to pierce and divide. It's the only thing, really, 
the word of God that knows how to divide between our spirit and our soul. That's complex. Okay? That's very complex. We, we have this spirit, right, that gives us life from God. We became a living being. We, we, we even get the Holy Spirit of God, right? We know that our soul is basically who we are. Right? And, and he put a flesh over it, but our soul is going to continue to go on. Our soul is what needs to be saved. Right? And, uh, but, but how do you discern a thought from the soul and the spirit? I can discern when, when that spirit is not my spirit. Right? I know. Okay, that was the devil. That was temptation. Right? That, that was an unpure thought. That's the enemy. I can discern that, but how do I discern what is me and what is God? Have you ever said this, you know, about the voice of God? It sounds like my voice. It's the same voice, right? It sounds the same. You need the word to be able to devise what is from God and what is you. So you develop that ear for the word of God, the voice of God for you. Even though it sounds like you, that was God. Only the word can do that. The word knows how to cut right in between that. And divide that for us to have understanding. This is why people get all messed up. Well, I just think that God would. Well, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Where is that coming from? Does that line up with the word? It's good if what you think God said lines up with the word. That's good. But oftentimes it doesn't. We lean to our own understanding. But the word of God knows how to shoot, slice right in between there. Thank you, Jesus. It says, and of joints and marrow. Not too many people buy whole chicken anymore, but how many of you still buy whole chicken and you cut it up? The heart, yeah, no one does that anymore. You buy it already cut up, skinned if you wanted, everything else, right? I know. But, but back in the day, right, and I'm going to tell you, the hardest thing to do is to cut the joints, to cut them in the right place. The problem with buying a whole chicken now and cutting it up is you mutilate it. Like, I just wanted the dark meat, the thigh, but there's some white meat attached to it. That's because you cut it wrong, right? You didn't cut where the parts are. You didn't, you didn't cut where the joints are. And where the joints are, here's the amazing thing. You find out, you find out the things that hold those joints together. They're hard. They're, they're flexible so the joint can move. But it's amazing, that what God uses to hold that joint together. The sword of the Spirit is so amazing, it can make a perfect cut in the joints. An analogy being here, how, how the word of God, the sword can cut. And even the marrow. The marrow is inside the bone. The bone, which is hard, right? Overcome or encases the marrow that is in it. The sword of the spirit, the word of God, is so sharp that it can cut right through that bone without shattering it and get to the marrow. That's pretty powerful. It is so surgical, right? And a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, which is probably the hardest thing to, to deal with, to cut open. Right? The last thing we ever want is to have hardness of heart against God. But oftentimes we're fragmented. Like this part of my life is wide open. This part over here, I got a spot of hardness. I ain't sharing that with nobody. Right? And that's where the Word of God, if you allow the Word of God to keep working on that area, you'll eventually expose it to God and have wholeness in your life. But sometimes that hurt, sometimes that hurt, that pain, whatever it was, that abuse, whatever it might have been, it's so difficult, we cover it up without even realizing it, and then we have it hard against God. But trust me, if you're a child of God, the Word's after it. The Word will press on it. The worst part is when God uses someone to press on it. When God, you know, that person always knows that spot on me. And so you don't even want to deal with them. You don't want to see them because they're going to make you deal with that. They're going to press on. You know, they got the nerve to ask you questions. Like, what happened to you? What was the incident? 
What occurred to you? Why are you so hard in that area? Why do you always back up in that area in our relationship? Right? But the word of God can clean that up. The word of God can surgically cut that and remove that. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. And so think about as it relates to fighting our enemy then. As it relates to fighting our enemy, you see there surgically that it works on us. But at the same time, what does it do? It cuts through the defense and it cuts through the armor of the defense. No matter how shielded the defense is against you, that's coming against you, it cuts right through that. It cuts through any protection that the enemy has on their behalf, right? And so that's what's so powerful about the word of God. So, but oftentimes God doesn't need to use somebody because the word works, right? Have you ever read something in the word of God or you hear the preached word of God and next thing you know, you realize, "Uh uh-oh, there's something wrong with me. It has worked on me, right? Um, this last Sunday, I was uh, very open with everybody about what I'm going through with grief and how that has kind of put a, put a weight in my life uh, these last two years. And, uh, and so, you know, I kind of felt after that, I says, well, that was never my intent to say that, but, you know, in the message, it just came out. And, and so, um, and so, But perhaps what's amazing even most about that is how many people have come to me since then, since this word started, and said, you have no idea how you have helped me today. Because they're feeling the same way. They're dealing with some of the same stuff, right? And and they're saying the same thing. Like, I've been dealing with mine for two years. I've been dealing with mine for for three years, you know. And and we are never going to say as children of God and Christians, especially in church circles, like, you know what? I think I'm down, discouraged, and, you know, and, and me and God just isn't, we're not as close as we used to be. Who's going to say that? Right? Especially as a leader. Like, oh, well, you know, he can't lead me. If that's true. He needs to be tight with God. Yeah. Right? But let's be real. Those things happen. They can happen. So, so he, here's what it is. The word of God, okay, even though that word was ministering to me, It cut while I was preaching. It cut and opened me up that I expressed my concerns about myself, my hurt, my pain, my grief. It it came flowing out. It was not my intent. There's nothing in my notes that says, at this time, share what you're going through. They don't say that in my notes. The, the, The sword of the Spirit carved that out of me and caused me to expose it. Now, I could have had a fight with God and said, no, I ain't doing it. But, but I have found this. It don't do you any good to fight against the word. Because then afterwards, I'm going to feel all bad. I've disappointed God. I'm not being real. What's wrong with me? Then the devil comes in and rides on that. And now I'm dealing with guilt on top of grief and everything. It's just a mess. I have learned. Just let God be in control. Let God be in control. And maybe that's why some people don't fully give themselves into the word because they're afraid what the word will expose. But you'll be better because of it. You'll be healed because of it. And here's what I found out. And people will empathize and have compassion because they're going through some of the same stuffs in life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, so it knows how to work. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal in the King James or physical in the Amplified. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying sophisticated arguments and everything exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought and purpose captive to the obedience of Christ. There, there it is. It is a weapon against our enemy, Right. Understand this, church, this is not a physical warfare. It manifests sometimes physically, but really, we can't fight it in the physical. To try and fight something in the physical is, (laughs) let's just share what I shared Sunday, is trying to go through grief and pain on your own. And it's only going to get you so far. 
We, we need God's help to get through some stuff, right? So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're not flesh and blood. They're not our own intellect. Right? Those things can help us, but when you bring God into it, man, real healing takes place. Okay? So, so it says these weapons are so powerful. The weapon of the word of God is so powerful that it destroys strongholds, fortresses. Right? Enemy, enemy strongholds with thick walls would have been happening in the Roman days. Amen. It, it knows how to crush those. It, it destroys sophisticated arguments against it and against you. Right. It, it, it is going to bring down everything and every exalted thing and proud thing that sets itself up against God in the knowledge of God. The word just works. It destroys those things. And so then what it does, it brings captive everything to its obedience. If you allow the word of God to work you. So in order to think about that, in order for us to carry out what God has called us to do. We have to allow the word to work on us, and we have to understand this, that we need the word of God to fight the hindrances that get in our way from doing God's work. Whatever God has called you to do, what's going to happen? You're going to have to fight the enemy, right? Nehemiah, building a wall, but at the same time got a sword in his hand. Why? Because the enemy's right there ready to attack us while we're trying to build. We're trying to build the kingdom of God in one hand. At the same time, we got to have a sword in the other for the enemy attack that's coming to stop us from doing what God has called us to do. That's how powerful we are in God's hands. That's why he gives us the sword of the spirit. Because think you're going to have to fight while you're building. If you think you can get to a place where I can just build and not have to worry about the enemy, you are going down. You have to fight while you're building. Oh, my. That wasn't in my notes. Hallelujah. That was a word. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Yes. And notice that Roman soldiers had other weapons, right? They had javelins, right? They could shoot arrows. But we don't get that. Because if we had javelins and arrows in, in the word, or the word of God was a javelin or an arrow, we would probably like that. Because that means I can take my enemy out that's way over there. But a sword means your enemy is on you. Your enemy is close to you. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat. The enemy's right here in my face in order for the sword to work. I wish... I wish we could throw a javelin. Oh, I see you, devil, way over there. No, don't work that way. God says, I'll let your enemies come up on you. Watch this. That that's, talks about the trials, the tribulations, those things that war against us, those things we have to overcome. What are they? They're personal. They're right up on us. They touch our hearts. Those are the things that we need to use the word of God for, that sword of the spirit. Thank you, Jesus. It's the only way we'll ever complete what God has called us to do. It means that we're going to engage in close combat. My God. Notice what it says in Acts 14 and 22. It says, strengthen the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Through many tribulations is how we're going to enter in. That means, again, tribulations run up on us close for it to be a real tribulation. So it's that close contact stuff, right? James 1, 2, and 4 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If you are praying, Lord, take away my trials, it's the wrong prayer. Because trials make us. Trials grow us. They develop patience in us, which means what? They develop maturity in us, right? So that we can be mature in the faith, right? So, so when we're praying that, we're praying the wrong prayer. God says, no, 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 no. I equipped you with everything you need to overcome your tribulation. 
We need to fight. Even when we say, I'm tired of fighting. No. Maybe you're not using your sword enough. Maybe you're not using it at all. Can you imagine how that looks? You, you, you got your sword right in your side here, and you're fighting tribulation, something close to you, and you never pull it out. It looks good on you, but you don't use it. Sometimes you get to a place, where, okay, that's enough. That's enough, devil. And you start putting the word on stuff. And you start putting the word on stuff. The word is going to work. So what is God saying? That we have to overcome in order to make it in. Right? I'm always amazed at the Apostle Paul talking about, you know, how he, he embraces the fellowship of suffering with Christ. Now, now, Paul's writing that, right, toward the end of his life. He's lived a lot of life as it relates to his relationship with Christ and many experiences. But he gets to a place now where he is saying, essentially, I'm, I love the tribulations because they acquaint me with Christ and his suffering. I know that's not going to give me a lot of amens. Even I don't want to say amen on that. But it's true. It's true. And I think that helps us with tribulations to understand that, you know what? I'm fellowshipping right now with Christ in this area. Because we never really go through it alone. We have Christ with us. And he's equipped us with his word. So we need a greater dependence on the word of God, right? To go through the sufferings that are going to come in our life or that we have in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. If we don't have trials, we don't have growth. There's nothing worse than, you know, a bunch of baby Hueys walking around. That's old school cartoon, you know, for young people. Amen. But, uh, you know, it, it's not good when you've been in the way, let me say it this way, in the Lord 20 years, and you haven't grown past those first two years of relationship with God. All right? So... We must understand that trials cause us to grow. And then when we grow, right, we become more like Christ. And when we become more like Christ, we enter into the kingdom. Thank you, Jesus. We're able to operate in the kingdom. We can see the kingdom. We understand kingdom. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. They are essential for our journey. Trials. Hardships pains, right? Who's going to make it into heaven? Overcomers. If you're raising your hand, I'm making it. It's because you're an overcomer. And, and that, perhaps that is brought out the most in uh, Revelations. Amen. Go to Revelations real quick. Revelations chapter 2. You know, Jesus speaking here to all these churches, these uh, the churches here of, of Revelation, the churches of Asia Minor, he has something to say to all of them. But in all of them, he finishes with that they need to overcome. There it is. We overcome, right? So Revelations 2 and 7. He says, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. All right? Then in verse 11, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt in the second death. Then Revelations 2 and 17, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. He that overcomes will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and a stone a new name written, which no man knoweth saving he that receive it. And then in chapter 3 and verse 5, he that overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. And then it says in verse 12, he that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Thank you, Jesus. We're all going to get a new name from Jesus. Verse 21, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and I'm set down with my Father in his throne. 
Well, if only overcomers make it into heaven, that means there are things that we're going to have to overcome. And we overcome how? With the sword of the Spirit. We're going to overcome with the Word of God. Matthew 24 and 13, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Right? Which means this. This is an endurance fight. <laughs> Amen. You know, in the Old Testament, you oftentimes, it's interesting, uh, when, when David got into trouble, that's the whole scripture text right there. says When it was the season where the kings go to battle, which I always find interesting, like there was a season when they would just go fight. You know, like the football season, right? There's a season to watch football. There, there was a season it seemed like the, the kings went out and battled with one another, right? Which is interesting. But we don't get a season. We have to endure to the end. It's funny when I'll ask the question, how many are in a trial? How many out of a trial? How many are in season? How many out of season? What I have found after a while, you don't know. You don't know. Like, yeah, I think I'm in or I'm out or I'm fighting two at the same time. I'm, I'm good over here, but I got a war going on over here. Right? We're fighting all the time. We're in war all the time. But here's what you find out, that you can be in war... In warfare, but you still have joy and peace and love and, and goodness. Why? Because you're winning the battle using your sword. Using the word of God. Yes. So, church, understand this, that we have a great weapon in the word of God. And it's important that we continue to use it. The sword of the spirit. So, again, the word has many... Areas that it refers to, how to be used. But I think the greatest is that sword of the Spirit. It is a sword. Thank you, Jesus. And it is a sword that is unstoppable. And it is a sword that no matter what comes against it, if you use the sword, you will be victorious with the sword of the Lord. Despite the odds. Right? Gideon again. 300 against 135,000. But watch this. The 300 never pulled their own sword. All they proclaimed was the sword of the Lord. And God gave them victory. He used the enemy's swords to kill each other. Right? And then they went in, won the remnant of the battle, right? And took all the spoils. They got all the victory. They got all of the gifts. They, I mean, they got all the spoils of victory from a battle that all they had to do was proclaim the sword of the Lord. How much more if we did the same thing and use the word of God, amen, on the things that come against us. God will give us the victory and he'll give us the spoils, which means you'll be blessed. Hallelujah. Any questions or comments before we close today? Anybody? Amen. Yes, Pastor Miz. No, I think it's part of it. Because we should be praying the word of God. Right? So when you, that's a very powerful prayer. And sometimes what it says is, is that we don't really pray the right way. Right? That's why the disciples ask Jesus, teach us to pray. And, and even in then, we sometimes can just kind of throw our requests out. Or be angry with God. Or frustrated with God. That's not prayer. Right? That's complaining. Now, he can handle it, but that's not really prayer. Prayer, prayer has in it a submissiveness, right? We're not going to go into the Lord's Prayer, but it starts out with worship to God. It starts out with understanding who he is, how great he is, what he can do. So it causes it to be in a place of dependence upon God. 
And then it goes on to the things that we need and, and forgiveness and all those other things, right? So, yes, that's what the sword is, right? It, it, almost, it almost there, I'm glad you brought that out. It gives us a picture of what is inherent in the word of God or the sword of the spirit. So since it refers to it as the word of God, then it says this, that we should be praying the word of God back to him. Do you understand how honoring that is to God? How is that not going to work when we pray the word back to God? And, and I mean praying it in faith with humility. Not like, well, God, your word says, so you need to do this. That's never going to work. That's the wrong heart. But praying it in faith back to God for the situation, circumstances in your life, the enemy's going to run. Right? It is also written that men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What was Jesus doing? He was using the word. Right? And using it with the right attitude and the right heart. So, yeah, very good. Prayer is definitely a part of, amen, the word and the sword of the spirit. Yes. Pastor Olivia. Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. You know, why do we have basically for those who are listening online, you know, different interpretations of the word of God and it comes out different when the word of God is obviously in many areas very clear and very plain. And that's true with most scripture. It's pretty clear and plain. Take it for his word. Right. If you know, here, here's the golden rule of scripture. If it makes common sense, don't make any other sense. Right. And so, you know, I've used that to go through the book of Revelation. If something in the book of Revelation makes sense the way it's written, don't try and make another sense out of it. But people will take the symbol. That's a symbolism and it means this and, and all that kind of stuff. Don't do that. Right now, when it doesn't make sense to us, common sense to us, then we need to make another sense. But very few things in scripture are like that. And I think part of that is because I believe there's been pastors or teachers, you have to understand that, you know, for a long time, there was no written word. You know, it was mostly Old Testament or it wasn't put in book form yet. Uh, I know, for instance, growing up myself in the Catholic church, right, you received all the word from the priest. You weren't encouraged to read your Bible. You didn't have a Bible. You had a Bible at home on the coffee table, and that's where you kept your birth certificates and stuff. But you didn't, it was, it was used like a locker, but it wasn't used to read it, right? So the people depended on the, quote, priest to get the word of God. So here's what happens, and I think it's well-intentioned, whether it was a priest or a pastor or whatever, when he's speaking to the people, what's he doing? Oftentimes... They will give you more to try and keep you in safety. Okay? If the Bible says, don't be drunk, here's a safe way for that to come across. Don't anybody drink. Well, the scripture doesn't say that, but if nobody drinks, no one's going to get drunk. Right? So that's well-intentioned. See? And so... so so I think a lot of that is what, what happens. But, but some of it, unfortunately, just can be the human element, or some of it can just be someone is pushing, using the word of God to push their own ideas. And so that's why we need to be able to know the word of God, study for ourselves, right? Because the word, again, is the discerner of truth. 
The word is a discerner of truth. And so um, you can apply a lot of the word of God and you can find principles in the word of God, but you better make sure you, you interpret them correctly. This is, the, this is part of the problem Jesus had concerning the law because there was the law, the written law, and then there was what was called the oral tradition of the law. And that oral tradition is when the priests and all those and the scribes and all those, they took it and interpreted it and then gave it out orally a certain way. And oftentimes it changed the meaning. So oftentimes Jesus would quote, I've noticed this sometimes in the Gospels, Jesus will say something and he'll say, you say, da 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 and there's no scripture there for that. Because he's talking about your oral tradition, how you interpreted things. And so that's what happened, for instance, with the Sabbath, right? Jesus' biggest fight probably in his time with the religious leaders was that he was looked at as someone who did not honor the Sabbath, so he couldn't be the Messiah. But they had the wrong interpretation of it. Even today, right, uh, Orthodox Jews, you know, I talked to someone once. Uh, we were on the golf course, and this, this man was a Jew, you know, found out I was a pastor, and then he says, you know, I'm a Jew, but I don't really practice, you know, the Jewish faith. He says, I just, I just can't understand that. I just got to sit home on Saturday and do nothing. I can't even get the light switch. And I said, man, that God did not intend that to happen. But that's what oral tradition did. And now look what that oral tradition did. Here's a man who's Jewish, and he won't follow the faith because that don't make sense to him. And so when Jesus, you know, would heal someone on the Sabbath, he's the devil. Right? And Jesus had to explain it. Well, wait a minute. If, if a donkey fell in a ditch on the Sabbath, you're going to help to get the donkey out. But I healed a man with a withered hand, and you got a problem with that? That is what your oral tradition did. And so that's, that's something that's just going to be inherent. That's why we got to know it for ourselves. Right? It's a good question. Yeah. Anybody else? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for your word today. And yes, it has enlightened us. And so, Lord, we thank you. It has increased our faith. And so, Lord, my prayer is that we continue to have a greater dependence on your word in our lives for all things. We give you the glory and we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that you are the word. My God, we thank you for the fullness of truth. Oh, God, bless your people in a mighty way. And, Lord, bless those, my God, that are giving today. Bless the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming today and know that we love you. Thank you, Jesus.